Great, thanks. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Adrienne Ferguson, Director of Communications here at the IIEA. So it's great to have you all here, uh, both in person and online on International Women's Day. And we're excited to host an important event on the subject, a European approach to combating violence against women and domestic violence with a truly brilliant panel of experts. We're delighted too that Liz Carolyn, who is an expert in accountability in the tech world and is an active member of the IIEA Digital Group, has agreed to chair today. And it's my pleasure to hand over to you now. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy International Women's Day. Um, I hope everybody has uh, already been to the polls or is going to the polls at some point today. Um, we won't be explicitly kind of talking about um, about uh, the the voting today, but I do think it's it's quite nice context for what we're going to be looking at, which is um, the, the on this International Women's Day, um, the EU directive to combat violence against women um, and uh, and domestic violence, and so. I'm absolutely thrilled that we have this panel here today of um, of, of uh, three women who are going to be talking us through um, the story behind the directive. We'll have some of the inside story, but also um, uh, where where has it gotten us to? Has it gone far enough? Um, and what tangible difference will it make um, to the lives of, um, of of women and others here um, in Ireland and across Europe? Um, I'm going to dive right in. And, and Francis, I'm going to ask you to, to speak first, if that's okay. Um, like it's been um, it's been two years to the day since um, uh, since this directive was proposed. And I understand that we're about a month away from it kind of again being finally kind of voted on and passed. And um, would you be able to talk us through, um, I guess, how we got here? Um, you know, um, you've been you've been you've been uh, you're obviously the MEP for Dublin City and County um, as well as being vice president of the EPP group in the European Parliament. Um, you're also a full member of the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee, um, as well as the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, um, and a substitute member of the of, of the Development Kit Committee. So I think, as well as being quite um, integrally involved in this, you, you're able to bring that much broader perspective for us and how this is kind of landing within within the European Parliament. Um, I know that you don't need much introduction, but um, <laughs> but yes, um, I'll, I'll I'll just I'll hand right over to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you'd like to, and, and as Francis is, is is getting ready, just a few notes. Um, so this is being um, broadcast online, um, and it is being recorded. So what we're saying um, in our remarks and also in the Q and A, uh, that will all be um, on the record. I hope you <laughs> you're, you're aware of that. Um, and I will be coming to people for questions towards the end. If you're um, here in the room, I'll be calling on you. Um, and um, if you're if, if you're listening in online, welcome and thank you. Um, and, and and please do um, submit some uh, questions through the chat as well. Over Thanks to you, Francis. Thank you very much, Liz, and thank you for the introduction. And good afternoon, everyone, and happy International Women's Day as well as Polling Day. Um, let's hope we get a, a, a good turnout and, uh, and, and the right result. Um, thanks again for the invitation to be here. Lovely to see Alex. We sold you together <laughs> over a number of years and um, delighted to have an opportunity today to talk about this issue, pernicious and all as it is and persistent and all as it is. So maybe just to give a little bit of background, uh, as you've asked, uh, Liz, great to be here with Rachel, of course, and Sarah, who really can talk about, you know, the practical implementation and the sort of unmet challenges that, that we still have. Um, I, I think it is, you know, one of the most important staging posts for our battle uh, uh, for equality, actually, uh, whether it's, you know, online or uh, at home or in the home. We've heard a lot about the home uh, during this uh, these referendum campaigns. And really, we know home can be a very dangerous place. And uh, that is sadly continues to be true. And uh, of course, it inhibits women uh, everywhere from achieving their potential, uh, for, from reaching equality. And we know the cost of not having equality is extremely high. It's high not just uh, at a personal level, but it's high at an economic level. And we're seeing the kind of figures uh, that are absolutely enormous that uh, violence against women is costing uh, the EU every single year. I've seen hundreds of billions being quoted from the Institute of uh, EIGE, uh, the Institute for Gender Equality, that really does provide fantastic stats on this. So we know the personal cost is, is huge. It's death uh, very often. Um, we know that every 10 years, a city the size of Zagreb, Amsterdam, Marseille, disappears from the face of the earth with the 858,000 women who are murdered and femicide simply because they're women. Uh, every 10 years. 
So the scale of it is incredible. I have to say I continue to be disappointed that it isn't higher up the policy priorities in every member state, in every country, because, um, as I say, every stat that you quote is extraordinary. And people are, I think, still surprised that it can be, you know, one in six women uh, facing sexual harassment, the high numbers of rape, etc. Um, it's almost, it seems sometimes as if it's separate from our day-to-day -day existence, and yet it's happening in parallel to so many people. Uh, and so we just have to grasp how very serious it is. I think Ireland has done very well in many ways. Uh, when I look at it from a European perspective, I see the, the progress that's been made in Ireland compared to some member states. Uh, for some member states, there are even more implications for the directive than there are for Ireland because they some states have no legislation on cyber violence. Some have no um, definitions of rape with consent. We do have that here. Um, importance of the consent issue, and I'll talk a bit more about that. So there's quite a, you know, and Europe is probably the most advanced place uh, in the world in relation to this issue. And yet we, we still have huge variation uh, in the member states. So it, it, you asked, you know, how did it come about? What's the view of it now? Really, it's the efforts of many people over probably 30 years. I mean, it is surprising that this is the first time there's been a directive on violence at European level. It's the very first directive. And you kind of say, given what we know about violence against women, how come? And again, it wasn't high up enough uh, on the policy uh, priorities. This has been a very com good commission, I would say, for a good mandate for gender equality. We've had quite a few initiatives. We've had the pay transparency. We've had the women and boards directive. We have one on the equality bodies. Uh, and now we have the directive. So I think Ursula von der Leyen has put it as a high priority and it has been um, seen as such. And uh, she came out with the proposal, by the way, this day, uh, two years ago, uh, the proposal was published. So it's taken two years of work. Um, in April, we will have a vote on it in the plenary session. The committee endorsed it overwhelmingly. And then uh, Ireland has three years to implement it. And within, I think it's another five years, there will be a review and that will be important. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. So it, it's, it's the efforts of many people, you know, uh, no one section uh, of society does this on their own. It's, uh, you know, it's the work of the NGOs, the frontline people. Um, it's the work of parliamentarians who care about it, uh, commissioners who are motivated, uh, the victims who've had the courage to speak out and their families. I think that's a very important part to change. Um, we see that whether it's referendums or anywhere else, we know it's about a multi-stakeholder approach that really will make a difference. And uh, there's been a lot of consultation. We had huge contact from uh, NGOs uh, across Europe. And uh, we, we came up with a parliament uh, position. Uh, the parliament position was stronger than the commissions in many way, ways. Um, so basically what we were doing was five key elements, setting the same minimum standards for crimes, safe reporting and risk assessment procedures, respect for victims' privacy and judicial proceedings, right to compensation, very tricky one, support for victims through helplines and crisis centres, and better coordination and cooperation between member states and cross-border crimes. So, I mean, it is a historic deal and it focuses on uh, protection, uh, prevention and prosecution, the three very important pillars uh, that we want to deal with. Uh, I can say a lot about the process. I mean, it was um, an awful lot of work. I mean, honestly, it's sometimes as a member of the European Parliament, I'm amazed at the amount of things we actually agree because the process at times is so consultative. You have the commission, you have the parliament, and uh, you have the council. And really, you've got to get agreement in all three and you have to move it forward. And, you know, we came up against a quite, uh, you know, serious blocks uh, with the council in relation to this, as you know, um, in relation to the commission. They presented, the, you know, they, they give the proposition, they, they present the first uh, possibilities. And then the parliament, you're working with like, you know, members from 27 member states, we're working with, at a technical level, you're working with the staff of all of the different parties. So you have a huge amount of technical work uh, being done all of the time, like hours and hours and hours, tens of hours um, with between technical teams. And of course, the parliament's position was very progressive, I would say. And um, really, many of my colleagues wanted everything in it and uh, trying to 
manage that process was very difficult because you knew the council wouldn't agree. You knew the commission at times mightn't agree. So you're all the time. I mean, the great strength of the European institutions and the European Parliament is that you're working towards a consensus. You're working towards that. You're building consensus. But right to the last second, you know, everybody was trying to put more in. I'll give you some examples. And I mean, I would obviously at a personal level be totally open to that. But if the council, the member states have already agreed a position, it can be very, very difficult to keep adding things. So they've got to go back to 27 member states. So, I, you know, my admiration for the process actually has certainly been heightened by my experience of doing the directive. It's, it's no mean feat uh, to, get, to, to, to get to a directive in any area. Very difficult, very different you know, attitudes, for example, to the obligations we should put in business. You see that in the European Parliament, to quote another area, um, you know, quite different views from the Nordics to Ireland to uh, the other uh, countries. But anyway, what we agreed here, um, you have to look at what the basis is in the treaties for this, and it was sexual exploitation. So you get down to a very technical point about what is sexual exploitation. Sounds very obvious when you say it, but when you actually begin to delve into it, you'd be surprised at the very strong legal advice we got from all sorts about what you can't include in it. What we did end up including in it was female genital mutilation, clearly exploitation, forced marriage, and then the non-consensual sharing of intimate or manipulated materials, cyber stalking, cyber harassment, the unsolicited receipt of sexually explicit material, cyber incitement to violence or hatred. So that is what will come into effect for over 450 million uh, citizens in the EU. And we didn't get the crime of rape into it. Most people, when they hear that, say, what, why isn't rape in it? You know, surely rape is sexual exploitation. The reason for the exclusion vary. Um, concerns about the EU's overreach into criminal law is one area. Uh, the classic power balance sensitivities between the Commission and the member states. Uh, I would say to political and cultural opposition from some conservative member states to such an overtly gendered piece of proposed legislation. Uh, the Council took a position that was contrary to the Commission and the Parliament. And we just simply, no matter what we did at national and international level, we could not get the qualified majority. We're very disappointed that France and Germany did not support this. We needed them for the qualified majority. It would have been by qualified majority uh, position. Um, I think, as I say, there were some cultural attitudes to the consent issue, for example. Um, you know, you, you begin to wonder what are the assumptions that some people are making about consent. Um, you sort of... Uh, the definition was very inclusive that we were proposing from the Commission and from the Parliament. Our legal advice was very strong. Council's advice was different. Now, the irony of not getting it into a directive and not to get too technical about it is that 22 member states have to implement the Istanbul Convention where rape is defined as lack of consent. So 22 member states will have to implement that anyway, but they didn't agree to put it in the directive. So... We can we can talk about that, but that is the situation. So um, you get to the end of a campaign then and, and work and you look at what's in the directive. And the question, I'll finish on this, the question had to be, well, you know, should we support it or should we say no? Um, is there enough in it to make it worthwhile? And the interesting thing is 95 percent of NGOs, lobbyists, everybody we were working with said, go ahead. You absolutely have to uh work on this, accept it, take what you have already and build on it. And that's what we're recommending. And that's what we brought to committee. Uh, there was enough in it to say it's important to go ahead. You have a directive with the points I've outlined and no awful lot on prevention. Some people would say, look, the offences, they are important. I don't mean to say they're not important, but the prevention work, the protection, the prosecution, of which there is an awful lot in the directive and a lot of new initiatives in the directive. This is a starting point. Um, as I said, when we, we got to that place, this is this is in the end, you know, this is a, this is yet another beginning and there is a lot of work to do. So we did get an overwhelming vote in the committee, uh, the important committee that were, was dealing with it. it that was a, a committee between the Women's Rights Committee and the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. And so they said they voted overwhelmingly in favour of the trilogue agreement. And as I say, we'll have a final vote. So. I'd conclude by saying, sadly, right across the European Union, we still have a very uneven, mixed and inadequate response to violence against women across Europe. 
Member states will now have a European directive uh, to guide their work in this area. Um, I think it will be central to the journey uh, of change. Um, it should mean that violence against women will receive a higher political and policy response from governments across Europe. So I hope I've given you a flavour of the directive and of the process of, of getting there over the last two years. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Francis, and thanks. That was, um, I, I nearly felt like I was in the room there with uh, some of those technical discussions and could smell the coffee. Um, and I think to go from um, that insider um, insight into how, as you said, you know, this directive, which is going to impact 450 million people um, uh, across Europe in the course of the next month or two. Um, to, to Rachel, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to you next, if, if, if that's all right. Um, so, so Rachel is the chief exec of the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, um, who, as I'm sure many of you know, um, run the amazing 24 hour helpline, uh, which is staffed by a lot of those volunteers, um, Francis, that, that, that you mentioned. Um, but the centre, it also runs um, uh, counselling, therapy services, and it provides that really valuable accompanying service um, to um, women as they're trying to navigate both the medical system and, and the, the, the justice system. So I think, you know, I'm really interested to hear from you about, um, you know, like, um, well, whether you were happy or disappointed with the directive, and uh, you know, it's it, it's it's always a little a little bit of both. Um, but I guess for you know, for the people who you and your team kind of serve, you know, what does this what does this mean? Thanks, Liz. Um, that was really interesting, Francis. It's always you know, Francis always has such a good take um, on what's happening um, in Europe. Um, and thanks to the IIEA for um, inviting me here today, Alex, Dara, Sarah, Barry, um, and all the other colleagues here. Um, I want to start by recognising the enormous contribution that um, Frances and her colleagues um, made um, in Europe with this directive. Um, Frances personally has obviously made great inroads just in the areas of justice, gender um, and equality um, through her political life. Um, and this is just one of her many legacies, um, this, this directive that we're here to talk about today. Um, but it's somewhat ironic, I suppose, that there's four women here on International Women's Day um, discussing something that didn't go far enough, um, as it's often the case um, for women when it comes to making progress. Um, we're told that compromising um, is the only way to move forward and longed for improvements need to be scaled back. And Frances really articulated the, the role of consensus um, uh, and it's a very important way to, to get progress. Um, but, you know, as a woman and reflecting on International Women's Day, I suppose, you know, what we hear sometimes is that we can have a few wins, but we can't actually have the prize of true gender equality. And the reality is that we're not going to achieve um, gender equality until we eliminate violence against women. And violence against women um, includes rape, of, of course it does. Um, and while the inclusion of a consent-based definition in the directive was dangled tantalizingly close to women in Europe, it was snatched away um, because that's what the 24 men and three women who make up the council had within their power to do. They used legal arguments, as Francis described, to cover um, their lack of political ambition on tackling sexual violence. And in doing so, we feel that they let the women of Europe down. Each of the three institutions, they developed their legal opinions um, with only the council expressing concerns, as Francis said, um, that including the criminalization of non-consensual non sex acts um, would overreach um, EU legal competencies. And Francis also explained um, that rape is not included in the list of Euro crimes um, listed in Article 83 um, of the, the treaty. Um, there was differing opinion around that with the Commissioner for Equality um, saying that Europe already used the exact same language um, and legal basis to criminalise non-consensual sexual activities with children. Um, so they stated that there was no legal argument against using, um, using it then. So the harmonization of a consent based definition of rape um, had been within touching distance and France and her colleagues were working so hard with NGOs across Europe and with political allies um, to try and get it included. 
um, and it would have given all women in the EU a consistent and an equitable path to justice, no matter what country they lived in. In Ireland, consent is defined in the Sexual Offences Act of 2017 as a person who freely and voluntarily agrees to engage in a sexual act. But other European countries have not gone as far. Um, and that means that in Europe, it still matters where you live when it comes to attaining justice. But the directive, as Francis has said, was so much more than a piece of legislation that included a consent based definition of rape. Um, and Sarah, Sarah will cover some of this later. Um, but when we heard, as Francis alluded, that the entire directive was at risk of collapsing because of attempts to derail it on the issue of rape, there was no other choice than to forego the accelerated progress we believed to be possible and to settle and compromise for what could be agreed, that consensus that Francis described. And that's just as women throughout history have had to do. And that was a really bad thing in the office. Um, but DRCC, we really wanted, we were part of that 95%. We really wanted the directive to pass, um, even, if, even if it wasn't a compromised sense, um, because there really are important provisions um, that will improve the lives of women and girls across the EU. And we were also really pleased that Frances and her team managed to include an article in the directive that recognises for the first time at EU level that rape is defined by a lack of consent by referencing the importance of preventing rape um, and it addresses the issue of consent through including new mandatory awareness campaigns um, across the EU. Adopting the directive also means that the there is the possibility to amend it, as Francis said, um, to include rape after the conclusion of the review period. And this is what we in Dublin Rape Crisis Centre will be doing alongside um, Francis and colleagues in the EU. So to sum it up, here we are on International Women's Day um, doing what women do best. We're putting on brave faces, picking ourselves up, telling each other that we'll get there. Um, we're focusing on the positives and we're united in our determination that we will get there because that's what women do um, but I want to finish up by being really clear um, we now have a directive on combating violence against women that does not criminalize rape based on a consent-based definition um, I believe that the consequences of this will be to deepen and widen inequalities that already exist across Europe and it illustrates that the barriers to progress that were intentionally put in the way by politicians were greater than the courage of some members states to overcoming to overcome them including a consent-based definition of rape in the directive was important for both legal and symbolic reasons and its um, exclusion sends a clear signal to victims and survivors across Europe that it was not a political priority the adoption of the directive could have marked a transformative moment in the EU's approach to combating violence against women. And again, we do recognise that this directive indicates much progress, but we also recognise the missed opportunities that could have significantly strengthened protections for all women in line with the standards of the Istanbul Convention. So we remain bitterly disappointed. Rape was excluded and on International Women's Day stand with the women across Europe who live with the consequences of compromising on equality every day of their lives. Our experience in DRCC over 45 years has taught us that progress towards gender equality and the full realisation of women's rights across the globe, including in Europe, is regrettably slow. I do want to underline my heartfelt and genuine thanks to Frances and the team um, who were unwavering in their commitment and tenacity um, to try and get this important provision included. And it's because of her that we have something to work with to be able to try again and make the directive stronger. And for that, the women of Europe owe oh, gratitude and thanks. And speaking about the directive, the Taoiseach said that he believes incremental progress in incremental progress. And that's true, at least moving forwards isn't going backwards, but that's a really hard pill to swallow when you're the one who's always told to push for change, but not too much, that the world isn't ready for gender equality just yet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. I think, you know, really powerful um, analysis there and also just helping kind of ground us in uh, the lived reality of 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 so many people um and that that potential that was there and um um Sarah Benson I want to come to you um last on the panel if that's all right um, and and there's, there's 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 a lot to reflect on there I think from what 
um, both uh, Francis and, and Rachel has said. So, so you are obviously the, the CEO of, of Women's Aid, uh, a national organization working to prevent and address the impact of domestic violence. Um, and before running Women's Aid, you were the CEO of, of, of Ruhama for, for nine years, uh, working with people um, affected by prostitution, um, uh, including victims of sex trafficking. You're an Irish expert on the violence against women uh, for the European Women's Lobby um, Observatory. Uh, you were, and, uh, and 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 you've also been chairperson of CAP International. So I think um, extremely well placed to give us some some reflections on all of this. And I think um, I, I I know that you're you've been you were involved in this process through some of the kind of pan European organizations that Women's Aid has been involved in. And, you know, Francis referenced the 30 years of work that went into this regulation. And I know that, that Women's Aid have been at the center of that. So I'd love kind of your reflections on, on the process as well. Um, and, and, it, um, and yeah, and, and on, um, if you see any opportunities in this, um, thank you. Well, thank you. And um, thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, and it's, it's actually, it's always a privilege to share a platform with our colleagues in the Dublin Right Crisis Centre because we're very much mirror organisations in many ways. Um, DRCC have the National Sexual Violence Helpline. We have the National Domestic Violence Helpline. We both, you know, accompany um, uh, victim survivors through different court processes. We campaign together, we lobby together, and we both have dedicated training uh, organizations because both of our organizations are structured as social change organizations on the basis that providing services to those to whom harm has already been perpetrated is, is completely insufficient if you're not also working to change the structures and the systems and improve them. And there is nothing at all that I would disagree with in what Rachel said. So I would just take that everything Rachel said take it that I would also have said the same thing. Um, I was, uh, my kind of role is maybe to, to kind of do some sort of reflections, also look at where the, the possible opportunities might be here um, with this directive, perhaps in the Irish context, but also, you know, for our colleagues across Europe who are involved in similar battles for gender equality, for, um, for, for specialist women's services, for rights, for entitlements, for, for legal recognition. But similarly to to Rachel, I, I I definitely want to pause and just uh you know um you know thank Frances for her absolute tenacity, uh, not just in uh, in her current role, but also uh, you know previously has an astonishingly strong track record as Minister for Children, as Minister for Justice, um in many different achievements. But but there are some real standouts that that mark a commitment to women's and children's <clears throat> safety and uh, and support through legal and uh, and, and public policy uh, positions. So I, I also had the, the great opportunity quite some years ago to do a study visit to to the um, to Brussels, which was specifically around trying to understand the council, the commission, the parliament, how they all work together, how they interact together. It's been three full days trying to just understand the basics and to, like if you were to to try and quiz me on it, there's absolutely no chance to, so even just that dizzying, staggering technical process to have navigated it and to have managed to try and uh, bring uh, this directive to, to completion. Um, and I know, you know, some of your colleagues, particularly some of your Swedish colleagues, again, just fought so hard. Um, um, so just, just to commend you on the success, because I think we have to look at anything, even if it's incremental. And, and as, as Rachel said, it always seems so incremental, but this is, this is how it goes. Um, and the pragmatist in me gets disappointed and then sucks it up and then accepts it and moves on. And, and we are members in Women's Aid of the Women Against Violence Europe, the WAVE network. Um, and uh, this is a pan-European network um, based in, in, um, in, in Vienna, but pan-European network of uh, frontline domestic and sexual violence services. And uh, it could not be more clear to me every time I meet my colleagues, which I do a number of times a year, just how much harder and how much more challenging it is for some of our colleagues in other countries. And just today, being International Women's Day, uh, a dear friend and colleague who is working with an organization called Rosa in Hungary reached out just to say happy International Women's Day. And I said, tell me, and he goes, something good that's happening. <laughs> um, and she said, I can't, there is nothing, nothing good that's happening for women um, in terms of uh, combating violence against women. And the last time I saw her, uh, we were reflecting on the, um, uh, you know, on the, 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 um, the, the dynamics in, in Europe uh, with different governments. And 
it's it's really quite challenging when somebody who has devoted their life to combating uh, violence against women and children uh, says, well, perhaps the change of government in Poland will have a positive impact <laughs> with us simply on the basis of, you know, alliances. Might, but, but, you know, that's a stretch, you know, so um, so the stakes are very high for for women and uh, and and children everywhere. All victims of domestic and sexual violence, I should say, uh, our work is particularly on women and children um, uh, in terms of anything that will kind of be that rising tide to lift all boats. And, and a directive such as this is only ever a baseline. Um, the same as with Istanbul. These are baselines. This is not the ceiling to which member states must aspire. This is a baseline that we work uh, work from. And similarly, when we heard the news that it didn't look like firstly rape had been accepted and then there was the question as well, would it go ahead? We, we did a lot of soul searching in a short period of time and did look at what our colleagues in you know, the WAVE network were saying, what our colleagues in the European Women's Lobby were saying and, and realized, you know, we, we have to actually look for what is going to be beneficial in this and, and set this one aside, dust ourselves off. And, and throw our weight behind it. And it's a little interesting, I'm not gonna to get too reflective on kind of what's going on today, but we have been involved in a process of reflection over these last number of weeks around a different proposition. And I think a protest no, um, which is always for the status quo, <laughs> um, you really have to look at what are the consequences. And, and as, as, as in that case, as in this case, it was like, no, it, it is better to pr push forward and build on that. And this adds to, the kind of the other suite of tools which we rely on both within Europe. So, you know, we have the Istanbul Convention, which I mentioned, we have the Human Trafficking Directive uh, Convention. And then, you know, at UN level, we have CEDAW, we have the ILO Convention on you know, sexual harassment. All of these things are you know, part of our toolkit. And then we must be ingenious and clever and crucially work together and collaboratively to look at where the gains and the opportunities are. So that's where we're at with this directive now. And one of the things that we, we we're very interested in um, was because cyber violence and cyber harassment is so prominent in this, we, we're like, well, what else is going on in this space and what do we want? And Ireland is in a very interesting position because our Commission Naman, uh, which is just established and, and you know, has you know, been building up its, its team in order to look at uh, our civil legislation, the online safety um, uh, directive, um, uh, sorry, uh, bill as uh, online safety media regulations bill. I think that's correct, um, which is the civil piece of legislation, but does require that they will put in place a code, um, a code of practice for in and a series of codes of practice for the actual service providers, the online uh, platforms. And they have published a draft which is for video sharing platforms and, and we, we were very unhappy with it because it very much focuses on children, which of course is important, but it really doesn't deal with issues which are criminal offences in Ireland, including image-based sexual abuse, the sharing of intimate images and other forms of online abuse. Um, and one of the things that we find very, very difficult from our frontline work with uh, those who have been subjected to this egregious form of abuse, which can have devastating consequences up to and including suicide ideation, including removal from workplace, from college, um, extraordinary levels of, of anxiety, depression. Um, you know, it, 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 is, it is something that one click of a button can cause such absolute, you know, it can just fracture somebody's life into pieces. And so we're very upset that, you know, pursuing a criminal charge and our legislation is quite good. The harmful uh, harassment and harmful communications act is, is, is good on this. But as we know, pursuing a criminal case takes so, so long. And what we hear is this thing is online, it's on fire, it's all over the internet, get it down, get it down, get it down. And we had really hoped that the civil legislation would do more to help uh, that side of things. Um, as it currently stands, that's not going to be the case with this iteration. What I will acknowledge very much is that Commission and Man have been very open and we've met them a number of times and they know our concerns and they hear them. But when we saw this directive, um, we went, aha, <laughs> do we have something here that we can use? Because this will now require all member states to actually um, enact legislation on this. And what's unique about Ireland uh, in its reach and its power here is we have legislation, Commission Naman, 
um, actually is not just regulating for Ireland. It is actually technically regulating for most of Europe um, in nearly every instance when you talk about the video sharing platforms, because nearly all of them have their actual commercial base in Ireland. So regulating here is regulating for Europe. Um, so this is something that we're very interested in and, and we were quick to actually flag to them. You know, this hasn't been passed by Parliament, but here is the wording. And there are certain things where it looks like if criminal proceedings have been initiated, there will be obligations that will fall on making sure that um, that the member state makes sure that there's mechanisms to take things down. So these are these are the, the, the nuggets we're taking. And the other one then is we have our Harmful Harassment and Harmful Communications Act, and that itself is going to be reviewed next year. Um, there are certain components of this directive which we think will allow us to argue for additional forms of protection for things uh, such as doxing. It's not referred to as doxing in the directive, but that's um, that that doesn't really exist in that piece of legislation. So as I say, you know, where's where's the opportunities to actually build on that, and then recognizing that you know this has been welcomed by the European Women's Lobby. You know, with qualifications, it has been welcomed by our colleagues in the Wave Network again with qualifications, but. This is what we must always do. Uh, you know, we 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 must be dynamic. Uh, we must take the opportunities, and uh, and we must look for um, you know where where this is going to add um, to our work, which is in service of those who have been hurt, who have been harmed, but also those who have been risk at harm of harm um, and hurt, and and anything that adds to that toolkit has to be welcomed. So I'll stop there. That's okay. Yes, yes thank you. Um, Thanks, Sarah. And I think, yeah, just um, imagining your your colleagues sitting in in, in Hungary right now <laughs> um, on International Women's Day, it's um, yeah, and and I, and I spit a perspective, and I spit a perspective for us, um, as well as yeah, some of those opportunities that might be contained within, you know, even even if we do have some of those disappointments. And um, Francis, I want to give you a chance to respond because there's there's a lot being there's a, there's there's a lot being said there. Is is there anything that kind of comes to mind? They're very very thoughtful uh, commentaries. And, you know, I could sit here and get a, a bit more depressed than I am uh, uh, about the whole geopolitical situation yeah. in Europe, not to mind uh, equality as well and the unfinished work we have to do. But I suppose a couple of things. First of all, let me say, um, you want to say, where did the resistance come from? Let's be very clear. It did not come from the Commission. It did not come from the Parliament. It came from the representatives of the Prime Ministers of Europe. So what it has taught me, as if I didn't know, um, is how much work we have still to do on equality across Europe. Um, if you have this sort of a job to do to get rape included in a directive like this, my goodness, you know, I mean, that is extraordinary, I think, myself. Uh, whatever the concerns about overreach by the EU, it is shocking um, that they were not able to come up with a wording that they could live with, even if it was not you know, very extensive, even if it was, you know, a, a, a more concise, shall we say, um, uh, description of the offence that maybe the commission had come up with. You could have said the commission had a slight overreach. You know, some people would say that. Um, I, I wouldn't say it because I think, you know, we should go as absolutely as far as we can in relation to this in legislation. But it was the council rejected this. And as I said, I won't go back over the variety of reasons that were given. But there was a failure by the council to support the inclusion of rape, however you look at it. Second point, again, we have so much work to do at, at a member state level. Um, and the variation is huge. I mean, I had a colleague, I think it was Slovenia, who stood up from on the day we were making the decision amongst all of the shadow rapporteurs, will we go ahead or not? And she said, look, we will have nothing else if we do not have this directive. And that applies to quite a few member states. There are things in this directive that at least is a, not just at least, but is a very important beginning uh, for member states in relation to the wide variety of issues that it covers. So we have to keep that broad perspective in mind. The other win, and thank you for mentioning it, was that we actually, towards the very end, uh, and we did it, we got in under prevention. And of course, prevention, the legal competence is clear. The EU can do preventative work. We got a very important article in 36A on rape um, prevention and on an obligation on member states to uh, deal with the uh, consent issue and do, you know, mandatorily, they have to do much more work on consent than, than is being done. And as I say, there's big cultural resistances in some countries. So that was very important to have that in. And we also got that rape without consent is an offence 
in EU legislation for, for, for the first time. Uh, and so that was a very important win. Uh, now, it's in under the prevention section, not under the offences as such, but it's very important to have it in there. And finally, I would say there is a lot in this directive to work on uh, that we haven't had before. Um, sometimes the focus on rape takes away from all that. And I can understand why, you know, how people feel so strongly about it. But, you know, we have things in this like, I mean, a big, long list. I'm not going to go through the list with you, obviously. But we have a lot about children. We have a lot about awareness raising. We have a whole lot about training for all of the people who come in contact with the women, primarily women who uh, suffer from violence. We have um, a, a big win for Parliament, believe it or not. Why it's so hard to get this, but it was uh, data collection how important it is to get really high quality data collection throughout Europe. We got that in, disaggregated in a whole lot of different ways. We got a lot about support and hearing the child victim. Uh, we got a lot on role of specialist support services and national helplines, um, how you document uh, cyber violence, you know, a lot of detail and all of that. So, it's going to be about 100 pages. It's really worth looking at it. There's, there's lots of places that will improve services, even though we, you know, are, 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 are quite advanced. I think there's a lot in it as well. Uh, specialised services to be consulted when undertaking an individual assessment, ensuring that perpetrators can be barred from coming in within a certain distance of the victim's home, electronic monitoring. So I just want to get across. There's a lot of detail in this that I think will be very positive as it gets implemented. And of course, we have to monitor the implementation of it as well. Thanks, Francis. And I do want to open up to, to questions from the floor. So um, if anybody has any, and I know there might be some coming in, um, but I guess just as everyone's thinking of the question, like how how hopeful are you for that review? Because <laughs> we're looking at, so it's three plus plus five, is it? So it's kind of in, in, in eight years, in eight years time. Are, we, are you feeling hopeful? Me? Yeah. Oh, there's a lot <laughs> of work to be done. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the whole argument about overreach on criminal cases yeah. um, is quite difficult. I'm mm. very glad we've got the directive in now. Um, I think the, the parliament is probably going to move uh, more to the right. Yeah. Um, I have no idea what the attitudes... This is one of the reasons that people really wanted it to come in now, because they were not sure what yeah. happened. Not to mind just on rape, but on other issues, what mm -hmm. the, the attitudes might be. So, I mean, I think we're going into a, a challenging time around authoritarianism. Mm. I think democracy is under threat. That doesn't bode well for equality. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a far more challenging time, I think, right now and, and coming up. In Europe, mm. on equality, I think there's been backward movement in a, a number of member states. So, um, look, a lot of work to do. I mean, who can predict, you know, I mean, some places are in a war economy at the moment. You've got to keep that in mind. I mean, we condemn rape, uh, you know, in the, as a war crime. And yet we can't get it into our own legislation. Yeah. So it, it's a lot of work. But I mean, there's great energy out there as well. Mm. I mean, there's there's fabulous work being done by so many of the women's groups. And, you know, frontline services. So, you know, I wouldn't be, uh, I'm not sure over optimistic about it at all. I think a huge amount of work to be done yeah. because the variety of arguments against it, you know, so varied. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with what Francis said about yeah. the, the long road ahead. And um, I think why it was so dispiriting for us and others that we were so close to getting it into the directive, like it really was within touching distance. And as Francis has described, like we don't really know what the political landscape is going to look like um, in Europe over the, the next 12 months. And um, Sarah is probably able to speak to this better than I can, but there's actual, you know, resistance online to progress, you know, that we're, there's obviously the political um, architecture that may change, but also, um, online, you know, we see that um, people who have populist, like in this manosphere, um, that there are, you know, created um, incels who are act actively, um, you know, blocking measures like this and getting a lot of support for mm -hmm. them. And I suppose that could leak out from online into in person. And I think that again just to agree with Francis that the the fight will have to continue um I think that the fight like around issues like rape um will 
you know, they'll turn more sinister possibly, um, and there will be people um, who are very against provisions like this. Um, if the political um, the, the political landscape changes, and I suppose it's supported at a grassroots level by people who are um, against progress like this. Um, and I think that it's worth saying that just around the, the rape and sexual violence issue, and Francis mentioned um, prevention there, which is obviously um, hugely important. The the awful thing about sexual violence and domestic violence as well is that it is entirely preventable. It is not like um, a disease, like it's not infectious. It is one human doing it to another human. Um, and once you know you're clear on that, it makes it all the more horrifying that it's something that is so within the power of all of us to, to change. Um, and as society and politics does seem to be becoming more polarized um, and possibly more um, right wing. Um, that is a, a scary thing to consider. Um, and are we going to have the, the laws in place um, to be able to, to deal with that threat? Yeah. yeah, really, really good comments. And I think just that, yeah, that broader context of what's happening within Europe. I think we've often in this country really looked to Europe to be setting the <laughs> setting setting the bar and um, it is quite worrying. Can I just say that yeah. this touching this issue? We only had 13 member states that were supporting this. So it, it, it was unanimous, like in the Parliament and Commission, more or less. It was the council. There was only 13 member states ever who were supporting it. Oh. So there was that big number who were either on this on the on the fence or against. So there was always a challenge in the council. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Sorry, just uh, are there any because I've one or two questions coming in and anyone online you can you can add them in, in Zoom as well. Um yeah, Barry and Ella. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. My name is Barry Call from the Director of Research here. Thank you so much for being here and thanks for your important work. I have two quick questions, one for Francis and one for Sarah. Just you were talking about the council there. I'm just curious, and you specifically mentioned France and Germany, mm -hmm. which which um, resulted in qualified majority falling short. Were they for similar reasons or different reasons, just in the particularly in the, in the French and German cases? And if I can ask you, Sarah, on the you mentioned my commission, the man, and the kind of outside responsibility Ireland has here, given that we host so many of the big tech firms. I think you depict the scale of the problem really well. Do you think? Commission the man appreciate the scale of the problem as well, uh, or is there still kind of a, an education required for them to understand the scale of the problem as you depict it? Thanks. Yeah, I'll come to you first. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, I I suppose the the first the first thing one has to ask is what what are we defining as the problem? <laughs> um, and they you know so we we are talking about you know um a, you know gender-based violence in the round. Um, we are talking about uh, online abuse and things which are criminal offences. And yes, I would say that they do recognise um, that I think the, the the challenge actually is a little bit kind of, it's, it's a bit of a paradox is that because they understand the problem and because they are looking at it as to the scale at a pan-European level, that has created a hesitancy to go too far because it's like well if if we if we uh, if we introduce a you know a, a complaints mechanism do we have to take complaints from France and Germany and so I think there's a caution around that uh, I will say I mean I have met the, the the commissioner I mean and and I think there's a real openness there and they are relying on a phased process and um, they are scaling up they went from ten staff to hundred you know so there's all those practical things and I think it's just that we take a different perspective on what the approach might be. We had hoped that the first of these codes would be setting a standard and, and you know, taking a very clear um, uh, approach to, you know, to a, a strong and robust code. Whereas I think perhaps, and I don't wish at all, to, especially because I'm aware this is on the record, to speak for, for, for the Commission, is that perhaps an, a different approach has been taken of, oh, well, this will be our first one, let's get this over the line and then build up. I tend usually to come from the perspective as go in as hard as you can, get as much as you can, because after that, everyone will be chipping away. So I think that that perhaps is the, you know, but there there is a huge, you know, economic, you know, I mean, there's broader things at play here. These are businesses that, you know, um, you know, have thousands and thousands of people and 
you know, are part of the economy, therefore part of the, the kind of the discourse here as well. And they, they are pushing, they are rejected, like, I mean, two of them have, there's a judicial review for, for two of them where they refuse to even be defined as video sharing platforms. The resistance is huge, huge, which I think means we have to accept that these are not willing partners in online safety for children, for adults, for anybody. They're just not. They're mm -hmm. commercial interests mm -hmm. and they are not interested in going the extra mile. So they will have to be made to do it. Yeah. Um, and before I come back to, to, to Barry's first question, there's a related question um, just in terms of uh, the uh, combating the possible use of AI to generate some of these sort of images online. Say, were were, were that, you yeah. waiting for that question? Yeah. Well, actually, I was just going <laughs> to spin out to Rachel before, if I may, yeah. just in terms of that kind of broader reflection. Yeah. I think it's, it's something Rachel said uh, during her, her comments is that the, it's the, the correlation between gender inequality and and violence and sexual domestic and sexual violence. Mm -hmm. And in countries, it, it's like a seesaw in the countries with less equality, the world's of women and girls are smaller and the, mm. the risk of danger is higher. It, the, the two completely mm. correlate. And so in terms of like optimism, not, I think it's, uh, we, we can't and we don't uh, just look at, you know, taking action on specifically those, those uh, areas of violence against women and others. Um, when you see, and you see, when you see MEPs objecting to what um, their representatives in the council are doing, mm. um, there is something else at play there. And, mm. and I think we have to remember that we have across the world and in Ireland and in Europe, very high levels of gender in, mm. inequity and inequality mm. being two distinct mm. things it, everywhere, including political representation. And you have structures and systems and ways of doing things which are have been closed to walking in the shoes of other people, um, you know, sitting in the wheelchair of another person. There is there is. A huge amount of dismantling to do there so we have to really work at the the um the equity and the equality and the representation in all areas including politically mm. um if we're going to get over there is that kind of magic number of 35 percent being that tipping point you know women on their own can be isolated and not doesn't mean they can't be champions it does make it an awful lot harder but that kind of systemic sea change of perspectives and mm. what matters i mean mm. this is something that affects so many billions of people and yet to Francis' earlier point, why is it so hard? It costs a fortune if you want to take the economic view. It People are dying, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I think the two have to be connected. And AI is something that I really worry about. I, you know, it's very mm -hmm. interesting. It's very good for doing little, I'm learning about how to use it for doing summaries of policy reports and things. But on the other side, when you take what's happening online, I think we have to be really, really, really worried. Yeah. There's another point as, as well about the tech industries and our whole technological revolution, which I think is quite shocking. And it doesn't get that much coverage, actually. I was at the CSW in New York last year and the theme was about the tech industries and women and the future. And the absolute conclusion from it, which is quite shocking, is that the gender inequalities that we all know about are being replicated mm, in yeah. the tech industries. Because yeah. sometimes these industries seem so, you know, on point and so kind of glamorous and, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's involved and it's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, actually, the reality is there's really serious issues about gender inequality uh, in terms of uh, technology, women's access, particularly in the global south, but everywhere. Um, the research is still more male generated than female or, you know, the critical mass of either either sex. Um, so that's, you know, that's a really important point uh, yeah. that is of huge concern going forward. So we've yeah. a lot of work to do um, in that area. Yeah, we're, we're building artificial intelligence out of Reddit. Right out of like mm. the it, it is reading the internet mm. famously you know a bastion of gender equality and then turning that into intelligence it is yes. it is so in lots of ways to we've, got to be, we've got to be kind of you know cautious about that yeah like, that is a that is a real issue the other thing by the way is we need male champions I was going to say that too. male <laughs> champions are so important um and we 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 do have some but we don't have enough we need yeah. more in the council by the way <laughs> yeah so um. You know, because may, men are still predominantly the leaders in, 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 in politics, yeah. much and all as we'd like to see that critical mass changing. It's still certainly not in Ireland. We don't have a critical mass in the dole. Um, the European Parliament's about 39 percent. And you feel the difference, I have to say, 39 mm. percent. It's mm. a very equitable sort mm -hmm. of place in terms of the experience of being uh, an MEP there. But um, and on the question you asked, then uh, France and Germany, 
you know, it's kind of interesting. It was liberal ministers in both France and, and, and Germany, which people might find surprising. Sometimes they say things about my own group, the EPP, that it's very conservative. The EPP government supported it um, uh, or didn't go against it. <laughs> kind of another important qualification. And um, yeah, France and Germany, I think they use the legal but, you know, we often know that legal advice can be quite political as well. Mm -hmm. And it can, you know, go in different directions, as we saw during this directive. Uh, France and Germany, it was very much, you know, it's overreached by, by Europe. But I think there's another element, a more political element, which is that if you want to appease the far right in your country, particularly in France, mm -hmm. you might like to say, uh, well, actually, we're not going to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, by Europe on this. We're going to do our own law on, on consent and, and rape and so on. Mm -hmm. And they both countries have law on, on rape, but it was just they did not want to be told to, to have a more elaborate definition. They didn't want to be told. Now, you know, if I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky. I mean, maybe if there was a, I mean, I'm just saying this here, you know, in public, obviously, but maybe if there was a different definition from the beginning, it might have had more chance of success, but I'm not so sure. I'm just not mm -hmm. so sure. Because yeah. the resistance was like, every pressure was brought to bear by, by all of you, mm -hmm. by the NGOs, uh, by the parliament. We just couldn't get the shift on it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if a legal opinion gets very entrenched at an early stage, it can be very hard to change yeah. it as well. And I think the member states got frightened at the beginning about it. They just saw the definition as Europe trying to do too much on criminal justice and they pulled back. Mm. So, but, and, and, I mean, and that's another interesting manifestation of what you were saying of this kind of lurch to the right. It's not just, you know, well, you see, to, if it influences people who are normally more progressive, then you have a problem as well. Yeah. yeah. Or, or if, if it kind of erodes Europe's ability to to, to act collectively. Yes, as well. exactly. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are we are just at time. We are at time. Um, so I'm afraid we won't we won't have time for any more questions. Um, but Francis Fitzgerald, uh, MEP Sarah, um, Sarah Benson and Rachel Morrow. Thank you so much. It has been such a fantastic discussion. I have so many things to go away and find out about <laughs> and, get, and get angry about. Um, and thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming out here on, I know, on a really busy day um, for you guys and, and for everybody thank else. Um, uh, we this 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 uh, directive will be coming into force. Um, in the next sort of month or two. Um, and I'm sure we'll be revisiting it. The IIEA will be revisiting it um, as, we, as, as we see the impact that it has. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.